It's a trillion dollar enterprise that could permanently alter the energy landscape of the Americas. The oil sands of Alberta. But can development occur responsibly, or could the risks and environmental opposition derail it? Man-made things do fail, and this pipeline will leak. With the world's largest crude reserves next to Venezuela and Saudi Arabia at stake. Are you going to stick it out? It's a fundamental need for Canadians to get full value for its resources. We'll spend the next 30 minutes examining both sides of the contentious debate that has Canada's oil sands at a crossroads. Out here on the open water, Gerald Amos draws a memory from every cove, every inlet. This is a really good crabbing area, right up in the headwaters here, the head of the inlet. Amos is a member of the Heisla First Nation. The Heislas have lived off seafood, caught along the coast of British Columbia, Canada for generations. And they've largely been left alone. We are at the end of the road if you look at it from a blacktop point of view. And for the longest time, we preferred to keep it that way. But increasingly, Amos finds himself witnessing the rollback of the wild. More and more industries are setting up shop across the bay in Kitimat, a small coastal town here in British Columbia. Fortunately or unfortunately, um, people now know what we have here, that, you know, that uh, it's, it's actually the beginning of the road. It's a road that Canada is counting on to lead to North American energy independence. Domestic need met by domestic supply. And it's only possible thanks to the massive energy resources found in the province next door. These are Canada's oil sands, located in the province of Alberta. An estimated 168 billion barrels of oil lodged between tiny grains of sand. The oil sands are the world's third largest proven source of oil, and the world is invested in bringing this oil to market. Much of the oil sands development you see here in Alberta is thanks to Asian investment. Fully one-third of foreign direct investment in the oil sands comes from China. Chinese investment and foreign investment in general is very important to the development of the oil sands, so we do need that foreign investment. We can't fund all that capital just in Canada alone. Ryan Kubik is the chief financial officer for Canadian oil sands, which has the majority stake in the Syncrude mine. Chinese oil giants Sinook and Sinopec have invested more than 16 percent in Syncrude's two mining operations. There are no days off here. Gigantic trucks haul hundreds of tons of oil sand around the clock, which must be crushed, mixed with warm water, and sent to a plant where a tarry substance known as bitumen is extracted. Before it can become oil, it has to be upgraded, then refined. Just to give you an idea how large the trucks are here at the Syncrude mine that are taking the oil sands away, this is one of the tires for the largest vehicle here. It can carry 400 tons a load. That's 200 barrels of oil. The majority of the oil sands, though, are too deep underground to be mined by shovel and instead must be extracted from the sands with steam under heavy pressure. So from these uh, nine well pairs on this well pad, we're producing approximately 21,000 barrels of oil per day. Oil from Synovus and many other oil sands producers must be refined at refineries equipped to handle this very heavy oil. Canada hasn't built any new refineries since the 1980s because of high costs and politics. As a country, Canada is leaving tens of billions of dollars in revenue on the table every year because we're selling our oil at discounted prices because we don't have enough pipeline capacity over the longer term to, uh, to get it to market. 
getting to that global market requires infrastructure Canada doesn't have yet. It not only needs more refineries, but more pipelines. Pipelines from the oil sands to eastern Canada's existing refineries and pipelines to the heavy oil refineries in the United States. A broad network of pipelines have been proposed throughout North America to solve this problem. Most bring the heavy oil or bitumen to refineries in the United States Midwest and Gulf Coast. Canadian Natural Resources Minister Joe Oliver has made repeated visits to Washington, D.C. to discuss the oil sands. In 2020, even as it's expected to become the world's largest oil producer, the IEA projects that the U.S. will still need to import five and a half million barrels of oil per day in order to meet its energy demand. But environmentalists on both sides of the border worry about the energy and water intensive processes used to extract oil from the oil sands. And unfortunately, the tar sands, when you look at it over the life cycle, is more polluting and more toxic than conventional oil. By some estimates, the added difficulty generates around 12 percent more greenhouse gases per barrel of oil than from conventional oil production, a claim the industry disputes. We know that uh, all of the, uh, the easy to get light oil in the world is, uh, is running out, so as we move towards uh, the future of oil production, we are moving to those kinds of oils that are more difficult to extract. Minister Oliver is quick to point out Canada is still on track to meet its emissions reduction goals. The oil sands accounted for less than 8 percent of Canada's total emissions in 2011. Then there's what to do with the more than 170 square kilometers of wastewater ponds from the oil sand extraction. Environmentalists say these ponds contain chemicals so toxic they have poisoned wildlife. We're seeing this very explosive growth of, of oil sands development and very little progress in terms of actually restoring the land to something that would be considered to be equivalent to what was there before. Only Syncrude has successfully returned a mine to nature, and it took 30 years from start to finish. It was a decades-long process to mine it out, and it is a decades-long process to put it back. For conservationists, that's significant. The boreal forest, which lies above the oil sands deposits and is impacted by their development, is a critical component of the continental ecosystem. And this forest has often been referred to as the lungs of North America. And the reason that is, is because it actually stores 11 percent of the world's carbon. Opposition to the further development of the oil sands has taken up residents in hearing halls and boardrooms across the continent, creating a vigorous debate over whether those proposed pipelines should ever be laid in the ground. All of the pipeline projects and more would need to be approved for the industry to expand to the degree they want to. When we come back, we'll take you to the U.S. state of Nebraska, which has become ground zero in a continental battle over whether to build the Keystone XL pipeline. In a business world of information overload, we strip away the complexity and confusion to give you the essence of financial news. Pure value. Biz Asia America. Tibetan tranquility puts a smile on the face of Nebraska farmer and rancher Rick Hammond. It's not the, the blissful uh, Buddhist calm that I would strive for. What Rick collected on his world travels as a young man wasn't just mementos, but an environmental philosophy that shapes his care of more than 2,000 acres of Nebraska farmland. Well, I was in the upper Amazon of Ecuador and, uh, and saw the the oil exploration and the pollution that happens out there. We only have one world and I want wild places left for the generations to come. So the heifers are over there. Rick and his daughters care for more than 250 cattle and plant corn and soybeans. He's put some 250 acres into the state's conservation program. And it's been very beneficial to uh, wildlife and uh, we, we get to graze it. It's out of the program now, and so I've left it in grass. It's, it sounds like you would call yourself a conservationist. 
Right, and, and with this pipeline, I, I call myself an environmental activist. As back to nature as Rick Hammond hoped to be, industry caught up with him several times as pipeline companies came knocking on his door to get permission to lay pipe under his farmland. He's, he's full. One such company was Trans Canada. The Canadian pipeline company wants to extend its existing Keystone One pipeline to bring heavy oil from the oil sands in Hardesty, Alberta, through the Midwestern United States to Steel City, Nebraska, where it will connect to refineries in the American Gulf Coast, which can process such oil. The project is known as the Keystone XL pipeline. So when the Trans-Canada man came knocking on your door, yeah, that, what's that going through your mind? That, that didn't go down very good. I, I was polite and listened to him. Ultimately, Rick sold a strip of land to Trans-Canada for the first Keystone XL pipeline route. That route has since been moved to protect more of a crucial regional water source. And so I offered to give the money back to get my signature back, and they wouldn't do it. This is Rick Hammond's pasture land, and I'm standing on the easement that he sold to TransCanada a few years ago for the original Keystone XL pipeline route. There's no longer any pipeline stakes here, but what there is is a sign of protest. You can find similar signs just 32 kilometers away, where farmland owned by Rick's two sisters-in-law is now in the second proposed path of the Keystone XL pipeline. Well, when, when my niece Megan Hammond called and said, Hey, Aunt Abby, you and Aunt Terry are on the route of the pipeline, total shock and disbelief. No, th there's no way. Th that can't be. For more than 130 years, these fields have belonged to these sisters and to their family. My father started us working on the farm very early, like 9, 10, 11. He believed that we should work and work hard constantly. He didn't believe in us watching TV. We have experienced everything from, you know, floods to droughts to fires. What Abby Kleinschmidt and her sister Terry Harrington do not want to experience, though, is an oil spill. The sisters chart scenes like these. A July 2010 pipeline spill in the U.S. state of Michigan. A March 2013 oil spill in the U.S. state of Arkansas both carrying heavy crude from Canada's oil sands. The family fears what such a spill could do to their water supply and the prospects of passing their land on to their children. Man-made things do fail, and this pipeline will leak. And we, we do not want this in clean water. I don't know. There's some heart connection. It goes right to the core of to you. your family. I mean, this is, it's who we are. Yes. Yeah. Right. And that's this whole pipeline fight is just, it just goes directly right to my core. It just grabs me right there. Last spring, the family took their fight along with nearly 300 others to a hearing in Lincoln, Nebraska, where the U.S. State Department collected public opinion on the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. While the department is nominally in charge of making a final decision, President Barack Obama is expected to weigh in heavily on whether to allow the pipeline to be built. They tell us that it's good for us, but in truth, it's only good for the profits of big oil. <clears throat> TransCanada is spending millions of dollars to make its case to build Keystone XL, in 2012 alone, industry groups spent nearly $180 million to support the project. Opponents spent less than $5 million, according to a Think Progress analysis. It will be a supply line that will help keep American refineries running at capacity with a product that they rely on every day. Keystone XL will be safer than any other pipeline that has been built to date. A State Department environmental review reveals the company's existing Keystone One pipeline has reported leaking 14 times since going into operation in June 2010. TransCanada argues the spills have been small and that this new pipeline boasts the top technology for spill prevention in the world. Uh, we also have uh, dedicated leak detection specialists, something we think is unique to TransCanada, whose only job is to analyze the data that's being received from the pipeline and the 16,000 monitoring points we have along it for evidence of potential leaks. TransCanada says Keystone XL will require at least 20,000 skilled workers to build and will create $5 billion in property taxes during its operational lifetime. These are not minimum wage jobs. These are maximum wage jobs. 
And today's American workers need more of these types of jobs to pay, pay well. Every day this project is delayed means that these skilled workers are unable to get the hours they need to qualify for their health and pension benefits or to provide quality of life that they want for their families. U.S. President Barack Obama has said he will allow Keystone XL to be built, provided it does not contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. Hello, I'm Congressman Lee Terry from the state of Nebraska's 2nd District. But Nebraska Congressman Lee Terry has repeatedly led the charge to circumvent the presidential approval process in favor of a legislative approval process. I came here to be energy independent, to be able to use our own resources, to not use OPEC oil. In May 2013, Terry proposed and the U.S. House of Representatives passed a measure to allow Keystone XL to be built without a presidential permit. We still have to wait for the president to make a decision, and I just don't think he's going to make one. You think he's going to leave the decision undone indefinitely and yes. basically hold the project up? Yes. Why do you think that? Because that's what the en environmental group's ultimate plan is, is to delay it out of existence. Do you think that's been effective so far? They've done a damn good job of it so far. So far, the Keystone XL has been delayed for five years. In the meantime, the project has gained the support of a majority of Americans, with more than two-thirds favoring the Keystone XL pipeline. About one-third of Americans oppose it. Environmental groups and vocal Nebraska landowners aren't giving up, though. They filed a lawsuit against Nebraska's government questioning the constitutionality of a law to fast-track the Keystone XL pipeline route through the state. Because until this lawsuit's decided, the route within Nebraska is undetermined. Even if the president tomorrow said, this is the greatest project ever, I approve it, the route in Nebraska would be undetermined. Why should any of us be taking this risk when somebody else is getting all the reward? So that's why I'm staying in the fight. Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, Joe Oliver, brushes off the criticisms of ranchers and environmentalists. He regularly travels to Washington, D.C. to extol the virtues of Keystone XL and its promise to create energy independence for the continent. That if you don't get Keystone, yeah, will that right. you know, speed up the, the process well, of building it, the westbound pipeline yeah, it to will, China? It will intensify our need to diversify our market to, uh, uh, to the burgeoning uh, Asia-Pacific area. I mean, look, there's tremendous complementarity. I mean, we have a, uh, an overarching strategic objective uh, to diversify our resources. Empty threat? Not really. A pipeline known as the Enbridge Northern Gateway is already being reviewed by the Canadian government. We'll have more on that project and the controversy it's generating in a moment. Welcome to one of the last wild places in North America. This is British Columbia, Canada. It is here that the Wet'suwet'en people manage the forests and the salmon fisheries that inhabit some 22,000 square kilometers west of the Canadian Rockies. 
In our stories, it says that this river, with Tsinghua, is the lifeblood of our history, of our people, of our land. Without the water, who are we? For the Wet'suwet'en, living off the land reinforces what parents and children can accomplish together in a life cycle of birth to death. They celebrate both equally through ancient customs like this one. On this day, the Wet'suwet'en gather for a burial ceremony to remember a fallen friend. The tug of war between clans represents the struggle to live and the eventual surrender to the afterlife. Our father. Lord in heaven, help be thy name. The Wet'suwet'en see business the same way. Instead of welcoming industries like mining, logging, and fishing, which peter out once the resource is exhausted, they choose to manage the life cycle of development, one industry at a time. We're not anti-industry, but we will control what will happen on our territory and at what pace. Out on the Pacific Ocean, Heisla Nation member Gerald Amos observes the damage the industrial boom-bust cycle has left among his people when the local paper mill closed. You know, Eurocan was here for 30, less than 40 years. Um, they made a lot of money. They uh, created three or four or five hundred jobs. And one day it became un uneconomical and they moved on. You know, it took with them 500 jobs. Now, just across the bay, a new industry looms on the horizon. Pipeline company Enbridge has proposed the Northern Gateway Pipeline. It would travel 1,200 kilometers across First Nation land from the oil sands in Fort McMurray, Alberta, to the Port of Kitimat, British Columbia. The Port of Kitimat here behind me makes a lot of sense as the destination point for the Enbridge Pipeline. It's a deep water port that doesn't freeze over in the winter. But even more important than that is the fact that it's closer to Shanghai, China than either of the ports in either Vancouver, British Columbia or San Francisco, California. So far, Asia has been a largely untapped market for Canadian oil producers. Right now, they sell more than 99 percent of their oil to the United States for less money than they could get on the global oil market. So it's critical that we get another customer so that we can get world-class prices for our most important export. John Carruthers is the president of Enbridge's Northern Gateway Pipeline. It's his job to convince Canadians and their government to approve this critical link to a growing market that could allow Canadian oil companies to get a better price for their product. Canadian oil companies are counting on him. Canada right now is the single largest supplier of crude oil to the United States, but it makes sense for us to diversify those markets into Asian markets, etc. That's going to ensure that we get the best price for our product. That means we're maximizing tax revenues, crown royalties, economic benefits for all Canadians. But nearly a decade after it was initially proposed, Northern Gateway is caught up in red tape and public suspicion. You don't think that your investors are concerned about the length of time it's taking to get this project approved? I think we're all concerned about, well, one, how long will it take and what will the decision be? I think that's just, I mean, that, that is the process we're going through. Canada's federal government is expected to make a final decision by mid-2014, after 18 months of public hearings. While Enbridge says about two-thirds of the Aboriginal people groups that live along the pipeline's proposed path have accepted a 10 percent equity offer in the project, dozens of other so-called First Nations in British Columbia have banded together against it. On Wet'suwet'en territory, the message is clear. Let's have a moment's silence. They're gone. It will never be contemplated by the Wet'suwet'en that if or when, it's a done deal. John Ridsdale, also called Chief Namox, has officially banned all pipelines from Wet'suwet'en territory. He's taken his message to boardrooms, the National Review Panel, and even Enbridge investors. And the Wet'suwet'en have told him, your money will sit there and it will rot because the project will not happen. Alex Pietrella leads the Regional Industrial Development Society. He says Kitimat needs to welcome industry to improve the area's roads, education and health care. If we don't develop our resources and if we don't develop our economy, um, we'll one day stand there without the royalties and revenues that we need to, to feed the demands of society. Somebody has to say no at, at some point. You know, the Kalamazoo, a perfect example. Nobody said enough of the no and look what happened there. In July 2010, an Enbridge pipeline burst, 
dumping nearly 3.2 million liters of heavy oil into the Kalamazoo River in the northern United States. It took 17 hours before it was discovered. While more than 5.6 million liters of oil has now been recovered, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, estimates there are still more than 605,000 liters remaining, nearly 200,000 gallons. I would think we would have uh, recovered well over 90 percent of that oil. And I, I, I haven't read that latest. The current that they're still trying to get out of the bo bottom of the river is uh, close to 200,000. Well, it would not be, a, again, in looking at the barrels, you'd get the vast, you can get the vast majority of that oil out. What would you say Enbridge has learned from that that's informed its ability to make this pipeline safer? Yes, yeah, so, so again, it, it was a, a very humbling experience for Enbridge, uh, very tragic in terms of an incident that affected a waterway. So you, you look at that and say, how do we avoid that going forward? Enbridge says Northern Gateway will be able to detect a spill immediately and shut it down within 10 minutes. And if there is a problem, the pipeline will have 10 round-the-clock staffed pump stations for a quicker response. We can't guarantee that there won't be a spill, but that's why you go to such great assurances and, and learnings from what was happening. That's where the, the Enbridge, um, the Enbridge terminal would be. Gerald Amos worries more about the potential for an oil spill as tankers approach the port. It's a disaster in the making. Just the sheer, just the amount of rocks. I mean, it's it's riddled with reefs and. You know, and the, the windstorms that are, that are out there are unparalleled, you know, in terms of wave size and just the, the sheer force of the wind. In response, Enbridge has mandated a tanker certification program, two pilots per tanker as guides, and two tugs to escort every loaded tanker. If it can be built safely, this in itself, the innovation in that, the technology in that, um, the engineering knowledge in that, all that alone will become a product for the Canadian energy industry by itself. Despite adding millions of dollars in safeguards, Enbridge could still have to find its mandate to build Northern Gateway in court. I, I don't think that, uh, that there are many First Nations that could, could afford it. However, I think that the, the, this, there, there is so much passion around this, this issue that there are a lot of people who are prepared to, to fundraise. Are you going to stick it out? You've seen that we're very committed, but we're very committed for, for two basic reasons. One, it's a fundamental need for Canadians to get full value for its resources. The second is to, we, we believe it can be built and operated safely. Yet Wall Street firms Goldman Sachs and Standard & Poor's are hedging their bets. Both have issued reports saying the oil sands production targets can't be met without additional pipelines. One analyst coined the phrase stranded assets for the oil sands. Do you believe that you could become stranded here in Alberta? I don't believe that. Like I say, markets are persistent and markets are ultimately the masters. Until that pipeline infrastructure is in place, more and more Canadian oil is moving to rail. The industry has already responded with that rail transportation that five years ago you wouldn't have thought would happen. Rail transport has dangers of its own, as Canadians learned in July 2013 when a train carrying more than 7.5 million litres of light crude oil spilled in Lake Megantic, Quebec. 47 people died in the explosions and fires that followed. But North America is still a continent with the world's highest energy consumption, and its lack of oil reserves has made it dependent on foreign nations. China, Russia and India aren't far behind North America in oil consumption and represent a hugely lucrative market for Canada. In the face of that demand, Canadian oil sands companies are at a crossroads, some bogged down in pipeline politics, all seeking to strike a balance between profit margins and public safety. The stakes are all too clear.